Welcome to the UIAAA Connection Podcast. Hometown Ticketing is proud to be the exclusive sponsor of the UIAAA Connection Podcast and to provide schools nationwide with the best options for digital ticketing for their events. Visit their website at hometownticketing.com to learn how they can make digital ticketing possible and simple at your school. Thank you to Hometown Ticketing for their exclusive sponsorship of the UIAAA Connection Podcast. Welcome back to another edition of the UIAAA Connection. I'm your host, Mark Hutch Hunter. Today we have as our special guest, Jeremy Lewis, Director of Athletics at American Fork High School in Utah. Welcome to the podcast, Jeremy. Thank you. It's good to be Let's here. Let's have you begin by sharing with our audience here in Utah and across the nation where you grew up, where you went to college, your first job, etc. cetera. Uh, I grew up in a small town in Nevada, Fallon, Nevada. It's about uh, 60 miles east of uh, Reno on Highway 50. And um, I, went to, I went to a lot of colleges. I, I wrestled uh, at uh, Rick's College in uh, Rexburg, Idaho. And I, then I attended the University of Nevada and Utah State and got my master's at Utah State. So that's a little so bit of you, you graduated from UNR? I did not graduate from UNR. I actually uh, transferred credits back and graduated from BYU-Idaho. And oh, uh, yes. Okay. And then and, uh, you got master's at Utah State then. That is correct, yeah. Where was your first teaching job? I uh, actually had American Fork. Um, I uh, I'd gone to school to to be a teacher at University of Nevada, and then uh, I got into the construction trade with my family and uh, was making uh, way too much money to be a teacher. <laughs> yeah. And so I I actually had a I had a job lined up. I was already the <clears throat> coach, the head wrestling coach at Sparks High School. I was mm. two years old. And the head coach there, and uh, they had a math job lined up for me, and I, uh, I decided not to continue the the teaching route at that time, and and uh, and went after the uh, the dollars in construction. What was it that took you then from the uh, the construction then back into the education field? Well, we were in uh, we're in residential construction, and. Uh, this little thing called the uh, recession in uh, 2008, 2009, that happened. And uh, uh-huh. it hit me pretty hard. And uh, it was an opportunity to do what I always wanted to do. And uh, there's a lot of stars that aligned that allowed it to happen. And uh, and I've been at American Fork High ever since. Well, let's talk for a minute about you grew up in Fallon, which is... It got to be a very, very small school, correct? Yeah, when I when I attended there, we had about uh, nine through twelve. We had about a thousand students in the in the student body. Oh, so not that small then. Yeah, it's a it's it encompasses all the kids in Churchill County uh, attend that school, um, but it was at that, that time it was in the large school division in Nevada, so we competed against the likes of uh the Vegas schools and the in the large Reno schools um that was our uh large school division well because i remember um talking to the Nevada guys at the section 7 meetings uh there's some smaller schools that are near Reno that are in the same league as West Wendover Nevada which is all the way on the other side of the state so, but I guess your school was bigger, so you didn't have to exactly worry about that then. Yeah, we had a little bit of travel because of it at the time. Uh, at that time, Elko was also in uh, our division, which was a four-hour bus ride mm-hmm. in our classification in, in the, the Reno schools. And then we usually didn't even have any participation with the Southern Nevada schools until the, uh, you know, the, the state tournaments and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, there are some small schools around the uh, Reno area, you know, within an hour of Reno that are really small. Okay, so if I'm if if my Nevada geography is correct and it's been challenged, so you if you're going east, you pass 
Lovelock, is that right? And then go south to Fallon? Yeah, it, there's actually a little turnoff before you get to Lovelock between Fernley and Lovelock. There's a little oh, okay. alternate route 95, and you head that straight south for about a half an hour, you'd run into it. Okay, so, and so 95, then 95 takes you sooner or later to Vegas if you stay Yeah, you can all the way to Vegas, yeah. So we're talking about um, – um, the the intersection of 95 and highway 50 run right through the heart of fallon okay all right perfect was there a lot of youth sports opportunity when you grew up in fallon it was a not that big of a city but certainly uh not that small yeah, they, of a city uh, in nevada it was yeah we had we had quite a bit of opportunity we actually had uh, a lot of opportunities provided by the actual schools too I mean, I played um, – our elementary school had fifth grade and sixth grade basketball that we played in the school. Mm -hmm. uh, I played in that league. Um, I played AYSO soccer. And then um, that was up until about fifth grade. And then in fifth grade, we finally got Pop Warner football in town. And so from fifth to eighth grade, I played Pop Warner football. Um, in fact, actually, fifth to eighth grade, I played Pop Warner football – I played the middle school on, on the middle school basketball teams. We actually had uh, teams at our junior highs. So seventh and eighth grade basketball. And I played uh, and I wrestled from fifth grade through eighth grade on the, uh, the junior high team as well. And then um, also played baseball. So I did four sports fifth through eighth grade and then three sports in high school. But yeah, there was, there was lots of opportunities that the community did a great job of providing those and uh, worked really well with the schools um, to do that as well. Excellent. Let's talk for a minute about some of the mentors you've had in your life that have made a, a difference to you uh, as you were growing up. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously my parents, um, you know, my, my dad, my dad is a basketball guy. Um, he's all he's, pretty crafty basketball player in fact but uh and i and i started on our junior high seventh and eighth grade team and then when i went to high school obviously i had to make a decision if i was going to continue wrestling where i'd already won i won two junior high league championships and i won two junior high uh basketball championships uh, oh, with wow my team. And so we were, uh, I was in this, and I started on that team too. So my dad's a basketball guy, but I kind of saw, you know, the writing on the wall that as that team went on to high school, I, I didn't think that they were going to be very good. It wasn't the, the best kids that I wanted to be around necessarily. All of them, some of them were really good dudes. Um, but I, I knew I, I, my best path for success would be to blaze my own. And, and so I chose wrestling. And my dad always was just there. He's a basketball guy, but mm -hmm. he was always there supporting me, um, learned, learned, learned wrestling alongside myself and my brothers. I was the first one in my family to wrestle. Um, you know, so that, that was, that was always great. You know, and then I got my coaches, uh, my wrestling coach in high school. He was the same coach that was my coach in fifth through eighth grade too, Louis Morai. Mm -hmm. And, uh, just a great man. And, uh, you know, we learned a lot, uh, a lot, a lot about life and what it means to to be a man and to to um, to be a team member and yet to have your own individual goals and aspirations. And uh, I always kind of felt like uh, I'm a builder. We we built that team. I, my coach and I. When I first I first went to the state tournament and took second as a sophomore, and only two of us only two of us went that year to state. Wow. But by the time I by the time I left between my coach and I and the work we did with everybody, um, we we qualified just about the whole team for the state tournament, and uh, and I think we finished in the top five, you know. So it was uh, uh, I like to look at myself as a, a builder. Did a similar thing with uh, Sparks High School a little bit and helped help get that going. Um, and, uh, and my college coach, um, Coach Bob Christensen. At mm -hmm. uh, college, uh, fantastic uh, man, um, a great coach of the fundamentals, 
Um, but uh, just a, a great coach of being a human being too and being um, the person that you should be. Great examples. Thanks so much for sharing that. Let's let's ask you a personal question for a minute now. What's your biggest failure or disappointment and what did you learn from it? Um, you know, I... I... <laughs> I don't know. I, I I think the one that I think some people look at when I tell them they they can hardly believe it. But um, in high school, I I I told you already. I went to the state championship match as as a sophomore, made it all the way to the finals, and I and I lost seven to five in the last few seconds. I gave up a takedown and lost the match to an upperclassman, you know. And so I didn't think it was too big of a deal. But then I. I uh, I lost in overtime the next year in the finals. Wow! And then my senior year, and I and I went in my senior year and my junior year as the number one ranked wrestler in Nevada in my weight class. And uh, I lost those two my sophomore year. I lost my junior year. I went in my senior year. I had a um, a kid out of Durango high school in Nevada that kind of there's a, there's a tournament we would see them at typically in uh, mm-hmm. Tonopah. Tonopah. Uh, in the on, middle on, of nowhere. On uh, 95 heading South, right? Some of the Vegas schools would come up yeah. and we would go down and, and, and Tonopah had a pretty good tournament and we'd meet there and Durango would go there, but he did not wrestle at that tournament. They held him out. Um, I don't know why. Maybe they didn't want to have a, a match too soon. Um, but I end up losing to um, that that uh, wrestler from Durango. I was winning with seven seconds to go. Wow! I was winning six to five, and I and I gave up a takedown. So it, it's uh you know they um it's called the hard luck kid. There was a mm-hmm. lot of things in those matches. Uh, you you can see in the one match the the official wave his arm out twice to give a two count, but doesn't award the points at all. Um, There's, there's just, there's some, some things that just don't go quite my way, you know, but um, I end up the three time state runner up and it uh, many people look at that as a failure, but it kept me hungry. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, I had aspirations to to wrestle at BYU and they wouldn't look at me or anything. And I I just was like, I'm gonna go on an LDS mission and I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna walk on at BYU. Well, I, when I'm gone, BYU cancels their program. Mm. And so I don't even know about Rick's college or junior colleges or anything. And uh I get lined up with some some leaders and some help to um my plan wasn't even go to school at that point when, when I came back and uh, I got some hookups and, and got sent up to, to Rick's college and uh, it was too late for any scholarships or anything, but I walked on and uh, losing those three state championships put me in a position where I was hungry and I was, uh, I really felt like every time I beat somebody, I kind of just took their state championship. Um, when I joined that team, there was seven state champions in my weight class vying for the number one spot. Wow. And by the time there was a four timer from Idaho, a couple state champions, there's one from Alaska, one from Wyoming, um, a couple from Utah. Um, and, and by the, by the time I, I got to the top position, I'd beat them all, you know, and, uh, here was this little kid out of no place Nevada that never won a state championship, but suddenly he's found himself in the starting lineup and earns a scholarship and everything else. And I think that's, you know, I, I, I think that's uh, one of the greatest lessons I learned was to um, let it keep me hungry and, and uh, get me humble. I mean, if I'm, I'm really this close to winning three state championships in high school. Yeah. And who knows where that takes me? You know, I, I, um, yeah. So, you know, it took me there and, and put me in a very good spot. And I learned a lot about coaching from Coach Christensen at, uh, at at Rick's College. And that's ultimately what I wanted to do. And I and I was able to learn those things there that I wanted to uh, take forward in my life. That's an incredible story. Thanks so much for sharing. 
I, I'm interested now to find out how a, a Nevada kid from Fallon, Nevada, winds up as the AD at American Fork in Utah. <laughs> so tell us how that goes. You know, um, I, I I don't know. I, I I think I'm fairly well connected. Um, I'm also, uh, I'm a well-rounded athlete myself. I've always loved being around athletics. Um, uh, my wife is uh, a former basketball player. Um, she played here locally at uh, at South in South Jordan at Bingham High School. Mm -hmm. um, she played for Rand Rasmussen there. And played then she, for Rand, sure. Yep. Yeah, she's a great basketball player. And then she went and she had offers from Salt Lake Community College and from Rick's College. And she went up to Rick's, and that's where I met her. And so um, – and, and she also played uh, soccer in high school. And so we, we got athletics in us. Um, I think I, I appreciate athletics no matter which sport it is. Um, but I just, I came over here as an assistant wrestling coach and uh, connected with the coaches here and, and uh, got invited to be an assistant athletic director um, about just a, just a couple years in. In fact, uh, it was in the second year in that the athletic director at the time asked me to be his assistant. And uh, the principal said, no, he can't do that. He's got too much on his plate. And I'm a little different than your normal brand new teacher. I, at the time when I started, I was 33 years old. Sure. I'd, I'd already run a business that had made millions of dollars as the general manager. I, I, I Don't tell me what I can and can't do. <laughs> You know, but he he said he, he wouldn't allow it. So that was my third year that uh, then with a new principal, I was allowed to uh, be the assistant athletic director. And then um, that athletic director moved on to be an administrator. And uh, they kind of just prepped me and and uh, said, here's the here's the keys and, and get the job done. Perfect. Let me ask you this, and I don't want to say too much about this. I want you to tell the story because I think this is one of the great stories that has come out of Utah in the past three or four years. But I want you to talk about the time American Fork and you in particular made the headlines at ESPN at a football <laughs> game. I know we laugh about it, but I, boy, I think that's I, not only did you do the right thing, it had to be the tough thing, but I want to, I want you to, to take our audience through that because I don't think anybody probably even knows about it, or maybe they'll hear you saying, Oh yeah, I remember that. But that had to be a, a tough situation to be in, particularly with, I know what some of those old timers are at each of the high schools in Utah, and they're not going to have some young kid tell them what to do, but I, I'll turn the time over to you to explain exactly what happened and how you got on the national news. Yeah, it was just um, you know we got uh, we got we got permission to play, and I think this is in the fall of twenty, was it? Mm -hmm, I think so. I mean, in the fall of twenty, and and the rest of the nation's not not playing; they're just not. In fact, there was a one game in Utah before us. I think on the previous that, night, right? It was on Thursday, and I think your game was the Friday. Yeah, and then and it was a TV game. We I think I think it was K Jazz was there. Or, AMYU, whatever it is, and and broadcasting, and so with uh, with the regulations for COVID, what we had to do to to allow the kids to play um, was to have a limited seating, was to make sure everybody was spread out, and and to you know make sure masks were worn, even though we were outside. And and here's the thing with me is. Even if we don't believe in these things or, or or align our own values with them or anything like that, it's still my job, right? And still, I want the kids to play. So, um, and I'm passionate about that. I want our kids to have a good experience. And I think about all those. I mean, I did three sports in high school, and and I want the reason why I got involved in it is I I want kids to have those good experiences that I had. And so if it meant I had to wear a mask, um, if it meant I had to limit attendance, then I was going to do that to help our kids play, you know, and, and where we, we knew this was on TV and everything. And um, I just didn't know quite how it was going to go down. 
Um, I met with both coaches ahead of time. Um, I met with the officials, tried to do all the pregame prep we could do. We had, we'd actually um, limited the number of ticket sales. We had sections assigned where they could sit and stay spread out. So there wasn't too many in the section. And we just, we just did our very best what we could do to prep for this. And um, we um, met with both, both the officials, the both coaches. And I, I said, Hey, if there's something wrong, I said, I have, I have the microphone and, and if it's not going quite right, we, we will have to stop the game because I, I want to make sure we can keep playing guys. And they said, yeah, if that's what we got to do. We got to do it, you know, cause they, they understood the situation we were in too. And, um, and I told them ahead of time, I was like, look, if, if this comes down to this, I said, I'm not going to stop it in the middle of a quarter. I'm not going to stop it during play. Um, I'll talk to, I'll bring the official that's on uh, that, that sideline official and I'll address him and, uh, and we'll have a stoppage that way if we need to. And it was a sunny day. Much. It was the yeah. sun was beating down. It was in August, and uh, our visiting bleachers, the visiting side, faces right into that sun. <laughs> I've been it's, in those bleachers. Yes, <laughs> it's just beaten down, and and so everybody that got in because they had a ticket to get in wasn't sitting in their assigned section. They all moved over to the west, and they were crowded on the west side. And it was it was really pretty packed on the west bleacher, and the east bleacher was pretty empty. Right, I because mean, the, the rules don't, the rules apply to everyone else, but they don't apply to me. So continue. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that was kind of it. It was like, guys, we we you have an assigned seating. You bought a ticket to sit in a certain section. This isn't like you get to choose. And being a high school, very hard to have the enforcement of that it's not like we have uh, a bunch of people that work at arenas and know right. how to get in the right seats and check tickets and everything else and and you're trying to do digital tickets anyway you know because of, of covid and we're not touching anything or, or doing anything so we're looking up and i'm talking with administration and and that's that west bleacher is just packed it's 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 way beyond the 50 percent capacity that we were allowed to continue football under right so under i went the up covid there. protocols sure yeah I, I, yeah there's the covid protocols that we had in place here and uh to to allow them to play so i i stopped at the end of the quarter and um went to the official and said hey we're gonna we're gonna stop the game for a minute here and i and i let both coaches know as well um, and, uh, we had a delay and I made an announcement and, uh, asked all those that weren't sitting in their correct section to please move. And when I did that, there was some backlash immediately. Um, but then there was the players. Uh, I could see it in their faces, the players, and, and they were yelling, they were yelling at the crowd to get back to their assigned seats so they could play football. You know, they didn't want football taken away from them because people couldn't sit where they want to. Right. Because the next option was, sure, we can play games, but no one comes. You know, that was that was always something that was discussed, too. But we're like, no, we got to have parents there and and a, and a few kids and some things that we can do. So um, the game was delayed for a little bit, not a lengthy amount of time. Um, but uh, the, the people complied. And they moved, and uh, eventually they complied. Yeah, they took a, it. Took a little pleading from the players and everybody else, and and uh, it took a few minutes. Um, but uh, it wasn't uh, an overabundance of time between quarters. Um, but uh, we just told them we weren't going to start until they moved, and uh, it was a battle. It was a battle all year with it. Um, you know, it, that's that's a tough one because it was on TV and. You know, I uh, ended up all over the uh, uh, different Twitter accounts, and there was everything from praise. I I, I got a, a card I keep on my desk here from the superintendent of Marshall Independent School District. You know, he sent me a letter in his card and said, hey, if there's anything we can ever do for you, 
and just complimenting me on the situation, you know, and then I got the other side, people just, you know, think I'm just a control freak and, and I'm not, I, I'm just trying to keep the kids playing. And that's, that was my goal there is, you know, I'll make the sacrifices and hopefully you all can too. So the kids can continue to play. Well, that's a great story. And thanks for sharing that. And I just want to let our listeners know that at least for my event, that was the right thing. And I just can't imagine. I can't imagine, but I've never been in that situation, how tough that was. And I think the most telling part of the story is when you talked about the kids finally telling the crowd, hey, you know, this is our game. We want to play it. And I think it's kind of sad in a way that people have to, to have kids tell them that. And I think it's sad that you got some backlash from the people that did because people need to remember what it was like. Utah was was one of the few states that was having fall sports back then. They didn't have I, them in Arizona. They didn't have them in in uh, Washington. They, I don't know if they had them in Nevada. Nevada. I know they didn't have it in California. So I I just think that's a I know I know it's a tough decision, but it was the correct decision. And I just think it's an, uh, that's the reason I asked you, because I just think people need to understand that sometimes it's very, very, very tough to do the right thing, but you're to be commended for that. So let me go to my next question, which is, since you first became the AD, and here we are in the first part of 2023, how has the job of athletic administrator changed? Um, You know, I... It's um, going through the COVID was really, really, really tough. And the COVID years, um, the additional responsibilities that were put on us, um, everything from swabbing noses and <laughs> that, yeah. you know, you know, and then, and then removing the, the, the fans from it. Um, those, those have impacted us kind of greatly, I think. Um, now, as we brought fans back in and everything else, there's this, you know, the, the, the group of seniors this year, they, they were freshmen when that happened. Mm -hmm. They were freshmen. And I guess the only reason why I can kind of keep track of it is because my daughter was a freshman at the time. Right. And, uh, and it was my, my son's senior year. Um, you know, he was he was out for track and he was going to throw the javelin and uh, never got to do that. You know, so there's uh, but the things that were put on us that just just tougher uh, crowd management has uh, gotten more difficult. Um, you see it quite often. I the the parents and and the kids are a lot more belligerent belligerent to the officials and to the players on the court um they feel like they're entitled to to say whatever they want to say i've seen um recently at a, at a girls basketball game a girl inbounding the ball on the sideline of that student body and the student body just yelling in the girl's ears and just derogatory and um, within just a couple feet leaning over from the bleacher and just like very unsportsmanlike, um, but they feel they can do that. And as long as we as administrators and as, as principals and ADs, and as we allow that to happen, then they're going to feel more and more entitled to do that. Um, and the same thing goes with parents and other fans. It just makes it really, really difficult um, you know, and the, and the kids on the court, they're in a tough spot yeah, because they're having things yelled at them. And it's really evident in basketball because things are so close, you know, in these high school arenas and these high school gyms, they're so close and it's just so much, um, intensity, especially these rivalries that we have, you know, um, we have a we have a school that's just north of us a little bit, and that's uh, considered a pretty pretty intense rivalry. And and those yeah. games get you know these are these are some of the things that are just added on just as as the dynamics and cultures of communities change. Um, 
you would have never seen stuff like that uh, 20 years ago. You just wouldn't have. I just that type of behavior was not tolerated in any shape or form. Yeah, that's well said. So thanks for sharing that. Let's have you speak for a moment about how you got involved in the UIAAA, the state association, and uh, now your position on the athletic director executive committee. Well, um, you know, I kind of don't know how that happened. <laughs> uh, I, um, I, 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 I'm, uh, part of uh, what's currently region four and, um, and I think, uh, Michael Connor, uh, approached me and, and asked me to, uh, start attending these meetings. And, um, I was like, well, what's it about? What do I need to do? And he's like, just show up, just come. And, um, and that's almost like three years ago now, um, that I started, started coming to the meetings and, and just, uh, learning what goes on there. I, I really had no idea going in and, and, um, and just trying to, trying to figure out my role and, and how I can, uh, be a representative for region four on that executive committee. And, uh, you know, just help uh, athletics and and uh, and our role in that overall as uh, in the state. Very good. What's one common myth about being an athletic administrator that you would like to debunk? Um, the amount of work. I I, I don't know. Uh, you know, when when I think about it, when I was a kid, even as our athletic director, I. I thought it was just some some dude that uh, or some lady that just got to go to all the games. <laughs> you just go to the games, watch the games. You know that's that sounds like a pretty good gig, right? I don't, yeah. I don't have, I just have to watch. I just got, I just go watch some games. I, I love all kinds of sports. I already told you that. You know, I'll go watch a swim meet. I'll go, I'll go watch wrestling match. I'll go watch basketball game, football. That sounds like a great time. You know, but the the effort it that. Uh, you know, in those circumstances, we take on the role of, you know, game manager and and making sure that the events, you know, uh, goes well. So everything from ticketing to officials and pay and, um, you know, locker room assignments and just making sure the athletes are all eligible too. like there's just so much that goes into making the event happen. And then making sure you have ticket takers and an announcer and a scorekeeper and all of these different things all falls on us. It has to happen. Um, the amount of time and what you actually do as an athletic director is uh, way beyond that of what the normal person thinks. It is, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of hours and there are, there are times um you know, in, with basketball games and stuff, I, I won't get home till 1030 at night. And, you know, I started, I, I still teach. Right. Right. I teach one, uh, one class each day. And so I got to be to that class first period. And then I spend the rest of the time working on my athletic uh, director responsibilities. And, and then I'm here with games all night long, you know, so uh, it happens a lot with lacrosse, happens a lot with basketball. And sometimes that's even a weeknight. Um, it's, it's a lot of time. Yeah, it seems, uh, if my memory serves me, even though I'm older, those January, February months where you've got boys basketball, you've got girls basketball, then you've possibly got a wrestling. I mean, there's, you might be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and you're right, getting right. home late. So that's. Yeah, it's, it's, it that's, just gets, it gets super busy and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's all day too. You know, it's, uh, it's really great in, um, in some of our, our athletic directors around the state are, uh, a full-time athletic director. And I think they're able to manipulate their hours a little bit because they, you know, if they, for example, if they're up late with the, with teams and stuff, they let them kind of come in a little bit later in the next day, you know, trying to keep those hours down, but it's a, it's a lot of hours, you know, it's, um, it, it's, you know, maybe sometimes those of us that are still teaching, it's, it's maybe too many irons in the fire. Yeah. It's a lot to do. It's a lot of responsibility. True enough. What's the favorite part of your job, Jeremy? You know, uh, the kids. I love the kids. I love the coaches. Um, you know, American Fork's been around since 1902. And just a couple years ago, I finally started 
American Forks uh, Caveman Coaches Hall of Fame. We didn't have a coaches any, awesome. any recognition for our our past coaches at all that had done so many great things. Um, you know, over fifty state championships and and over uh, there's probably another fifty to sixty state runner ups. Mm -hmm. Like the, we've been represented in the championship games or matches or things throughout the years, and no recognition for our coaches. So. A few years ago, I started the Caveman Coaches Hall of Fame, and we we have some inductees that we've put in there. That was a really special night to be able to do that. Um, and then uh, I've also started um, our all-time teams, which is recognizing the very best, for example, baseball team that's ever walked these halls. You know, we're trying to do some – NAF, that's tough because that's you've tough. had some great teams. Yeah, we had some had some really good teams, you know, and and so, um, you know, we we had a really great men's soccer team back in 1983 and 1984. A lot of people don't know that, but that was that was a really really good team. Um, I I remember because I was the coach of the Jordan team, that lost to them. <laughs> there so you I go. Know all about that. There you go. Right, and so you know, but but I but we but we started this, and and uh, I I have uh, there, we have another athletic director here, Rachel Philippi. Mm -hmm. um she's fantastic we share the role and uh you know this is a 6a school in utah this is a big school and uh it's a lot of work even with two of us it's it really is um but having that the recognizing the teams recognizing our our history and our coaches and spending time with them and and, and the current players and coaches uh, that's the best part of the job you know keeping it about the kids and helping them to have that good, positive experience. That's what we want. It's really tough to win a state championship. Uh, we yeah, should, we question. should know that it's, it's tough to win a region four championship. We all know that oh, too. Yeah, exactly. Region you know, four, the yeah. SEC of Utah, as they call it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, this is, uh, this is a tough place. So uh, we want our kids to have this, this good experience. Um, what I always say to our coaches and our parents and everybody else is, 10 years down the road, when I ask someone about, when you see them wearing a caveman apparel, American Fork stuff, I want them to say, I'm, I'm proud to be a caveman. I'm proud of my coaches. I'm proud of my experience. I love it. It wasn't always easy, but I'm proud to be a caveman. And that's what we want. That's, that's, so that's our goal here, is just to have that, uh, that within each of us. Perfect. Let me finish up with a couple of questions, Jeremy. The first being, you have two suggestions for a brand new AD, and they need to follow your suggestions in order to be successful. What would your two suggestions be? Um, the, the first one is to uh, build trust with your coaches. Because if you build trust, then when things go a little bit wrong, you can you can talk to them about it because they trust you that this is the best thing for them. You know, coaches aren't perfect. They're human beings. They're going to make mistakes. But if they know that they got someone that's got their back and is going to help them grow and get better in the profession, um, then that's going to make things really good for you. I think you got to have – you got to have the trust of the coaches. You got to build that relationship with your coaches. And a, a, a second thing um, would be to take care of yourself. Uh, it's it's a lot of time, and 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 so when it is a lot of time, don't feel bad if you got to leave the school for a little bit and go get a drink. <laughs> there you bad. go. Don't feel bad if your coach teaches a weights class and you want to go down and lift some weights during the day. You've earned it. There's a, it's a lot of time. You don't have the time to go work out when it's, uh, you know, you don't have time to go to the local gym and work out because your time's all here at the school. So take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Take care of your family and, and you're going to be able to enjoy the job for a long time. Great suggestions. Thanks for sharing those. 
Jeremy, what questions should I have asked you that I failed to ask you? Um, I don't know. I I think I'm. I, you you get me talking, and I can I can talk about a lot of things. <laughs> you asked some pretty good questions. I um, I just I'm proud to be a caveman, and All I right. and I think I've really. Maybe that might be my other suggestion for any any other new AD or, or where you're at, but be where your feet are. Drink the Kool-Aid. Just drink it up because it's uh, – Be good. Buy in. Be invested. I like it. And on that, that ends this edition of the UIAAA Connection. Our guest today has been Jeremy Lewis, the Director of Athletics at American Fork High School. Thanks so much for being with us today, Jeremy. Thank you. For our listeners, we hope you tune in again next week for another edition of the UIAAA Connection.